One of the problems with arguing with creationists is that they do not understand what evolution actually is, and instead insist on arguing against a straw man version that does not even make sense. RN Raw has made several videos that clear up a lot of those misunderstandings, but I believe this video will add on to what he has already done by using a step-by-step -step graphical representation. This video will describe the modern way in which life is classified. The second video in this series will cover the most common creationist mistakes. The third video will explain the evidence that supports the aforementioned relationships. When I went to high school back in the olden days, I learned of this classification system. This was imprecise due to the fact that such clear divisions do not exist. That is why we had to add subphyla and superfamilies and tribes, etc. That is why this system has been supplanted with a system of continually branching clades that is a far more flexible and accurate method of classification. To any creationist watching this video, no matter what you believe or disbelieve, this is what evolution actually is. This is called the cladogram. I will start with a single line representing the phylum of animals that we belong to called the chordates. This is a simple creature that is the progenitor of everything with a notochord, an endostyle, some kind of nervous system with a bulge, and an anal port connected to an intake port. Everything that branched off from the chordates is still a chordate no matter how much time or evolution transpires. Around 525 million years ago, this diversified into three groups, but I only want to focus on one for now. So everything above this line is a vertebrate, but importantly, everything above that line is also still a chordate. You can never be a vertebrate without being a chordate, because vertebrates have the same characteristics shared by other chordates. Every vertebrate has all the same characteristics as any other chordate, except vertebrates have a hard cranium and some sort of hard vertebral column allowing for quicker movement. Fast forward to the Ordovician period when the jawed vertebrates evolved. These diversified into the cartilaginous fishes, the rays, the sharks, and the sawfish, and nearly boned fishes. Tetrapods, the first land animals, evolved 390 million years ago, the earliest having a lot in common with the earliest low fin fishes. But keep in mind that while everything above this line is a tetrapod, everything above this line is still part of the same parent clades that came before it. So they are still osteichthys, nathostomatas, vertebrates, and chordates. This is where another major division happens. After the first amphibians evolved, the first creatures to lay their eggs on land diverged and some tetrapods found their niches further away from sources of water 312 million years ago. Those basal amniotes diverged into the synapsids and the seropsids. The former is the clade that eventually led to the modern mammals. By 302 million years ago, the latter eventually gave rise to the anapsids and the diapsids. We are going to leave the mammals alone for now and follow the line of the diapsids. They diverged several times, including with the emergence of the Saurians 265 million years ago. These branched off into the Lepidosaurs, which gave rise to the Squamates, and the Archosaurs, which I will be revisiting in the next video in this series. Archosaura is the last common ancestor between the Crocodilians and the Dinosaurs, so everything above this line is an Archosaur, while everything above this line is a Dinosaur. Of course, the dinosaurs branched out into several lineages, but the only ones to survive into the modern era are the birds. That's enough to get the basic idea. I will finish by showing the continuation of the line of our Ostinchi cousins who stayed in the water after our ancestors became tetrapods. They are now the modern bony fishes. The reason why this is such a great system is its precision and flexibility. A good example of this is the lungfish. Through analysis of phylogeny, it was discovered that the lungfish is closer related to tetrapods than modern bony fishes. We can add lungfish to our cladogram by adding the subgroup Cercoptergy, of which both lungfish and tetrapods diverge from. There is also the division of the lobe fin fishes, which are closer related to us, and the ray fin fishes. If I did enough research, I could probably find the last common ancestor of the amphibians and the other tetrapods. In addition, every one of those dashes is where some sort of evolutionary division occurred. I could include numerous other branches from each one of those, most of which have no extent descendants. The term reptiles is an interesting one. You may have noticed that I did not use it in the creation of this cladogram. That is because it is not a true clade any longer. When I was growing up, my elementary school taught me that a reptile was any cold-blooded animal with a three-chambered heart. But that poses a problem, because if dinosaurs are considered reptiles, then how do you explain the evidence that some dinosaurs were endothermic and have fossilized impressions of four-chambered hearts? 
What about birds? If birds are dinosaurs and dinosaurs are reptiles, then birds would still be reptiles. Because you cannot stop being a member of your parent clade just because you become more blooded. Even worse, if the qualification for what makes a reptile is being or having been a cold-blooded animal with a three-chambered heart, then reptile is basically just another word for amniotes, which would mean that even mammals would count as reptiles. <laughs> and that would be downright nutty. It is more accurate to classify these different tetrapods into subgroups based on their skull's temporal fenestrae, the holes on the side of their heads. The amniotes diverged into the synapses, which have one hole on the sides of their skulls behind their eyes, and the seropsids, which themselves split into two groups. The anapsids, which have no temporal fenestrae, and the diapsids, which have two temporal fenestrae. The true reptiles are considered the diapsids, which does not include the anapsids, the turtles and the tortoises. If you want to include the anapsids as reptiles, then the word reptile is synonymous with uh, seropsids. Although the first paleontologist to suggest this was not able to garner support for this idea because the relationships between anapsids and diapsids had not been determined at this time. And yes, that does mean that birds are also reptiles, although their two temporal fornestrae have been heavily modified. Reptile is not a clade, but it is considered what is called a monophyletic group. This allows the term to include all amniotes that are cold-blooded, but still allowing it to exclude the birds and some non-avian dinosaurs, as well as the mammals. This concludes the first video in this series. Please post any questions you have in the comment section. If I get enough, I may add a fourth video to this series.